This meeting of the School Board of the City of Virginia Beach is now in session. This is our formal meeting format. At this time, I ask that my colleagues and everyone in attendance please silence your electronic devices and phones. I ask my colleagues to acknowledge their presence on the voting board. Mr. McDonald is not with us this evening. At this time, I'm asking everyone to join me in a moment of silence. Please rise as you are able for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We will now proceed with our public awards and recognitions. Mrs. Rye. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to an evening of impressive recognitions. To help us progress through the multitude of honorees, we ask that you hold your applause until the end of each recognition. As a courtesy to all our honorees, we also kindly ask that you remain until the conclusion of all recognitions. We promise it won't take long and you'll be impressed. So let's get started. Our first recognition is for two Ocean Lakes High School students who earned a perfect score on the ACT, Joshua Minter and Noah Sirad. Both are juniors in the school's Math and Science Academy and achieved the highest possible composite score of 36 on the ACT, which tests students in English, mathematics, reading, and science. Minter plays varsity tennis, is treasurer of the programming club, and serves on the executive board of the newly formed Stocks Club. <laughs> Siraj, too, is involved in multiple activities. He's president of the Junior Classical League, as well as the Latin Honor Society, and is a member of the school's Varsity Scholastic Bowl, Math Honor Society, and Hampton Roads Scholastic Chess Club. Both are interested in the math science field. No surprise there. Congratulations on this outstanding achievement. Our next recognition is for four Princess Anne High School students who earned first place at the Microsoft Office Specialist State Championships. Junior Carly Clausen placed first in PowerPoint 2016. Senior, I'm sorry. Senior Nathaniel Pilash placed first in PowerPoint 2013. Senior Joseph Litz won first place in Word 2013. And senior Cameron Pilash was the top finisher in Word 2016. Students compete to be the fastest and most accurate finishers in their respective events. As state winners, they now move on to the national championship in Orlando this June where winners will advance to the World Championship. Congratulations. We will now recognize indoor track and field state champions. Several students earn state titles in athletics. Let's meet the 2019 VHSL track and field state champs. In class five, Princess Anne High School senior Tavon Mitchell is the boys' long jump champion. He won the title with an amazing jump of 22 feet, 8 inches. Yeah. 
Also winning a state title in Class 5 was Salem High School Girls 4x200 meter relay team. This team included senior Lyric Hodges, sophomore Abia Olds, freshman Andrea Armstrong, and junior Makia Jarrett. In winning that state title, this team also set a new state meet record with a time of 1 minute 42.3 seconds. In Class 6, Ocean Lakes High School freshman Ania Mosley is the girls' 1,000 meter champion. Mosley won with an impressive time of 2 minutes 58.12 seconds. Isaiah Carter, Tallwood High School senior, is the Class 6 boys 300-meter dash champion. Carter won his event with a time of 34.36 seconds. Congratulations to all of our track and field champs. Next, we recognize the 2019 Virginia High School League State Wrestling Champions. Being the mother of a wrestler myself, I've had the opportunity to watch uh, these wonderful young men compete, and they are impressive. Princess Anne High School senior Clarence Lee Green won the 113-pound Class 5 championship. He had a dominating run to win three total pins, all in one minute, 41 seconds or less. Bayside High School senior Gabriel Timms finished his senior finished his season with an amazing 30 wins and zero losses on his road to the Class 6 138 pound championship. He is Bayside's first wrestling state champion since 1978. <laughs> Kellum High's Nick Sansone, a senior, cruised to the Class 6 152-pound state title with a 5-0 decision following two pins in less than 1 minute 37 seconds. At, la at last but not least, we have two champions from First Colonial High School. Senior Cole Stoddard is the 145-pound champion in Class 6. He reached his 100th career victory this season. And also from First Colonial High School, senior Riley Parker is the 113 pound class six champion and the second wrestler in school history to be a two-time state champ. Congratulations, wrestlers. Let's now meet the 2019 Virginia High School League Swim and Dive State Champions from Class 6. Kellum High School senior Nicole Venema is the girls' 100-yard freestyle champion. She broke the state record with a time of 49.68 seconds. Kendall Ewing, Ocean Lakes High School Junior, is the boys' 100-yard backstroke champion. The remaining swim and dive champions are from First Colonial High School. Senior Kaysen Wilburn won back-to-back -back titles in the boys' 200-yard freestyle and 100-yard butterfly, all while breaking state records. Wow. For the second consecutive year, sophomore Samantha Tatter is the girls' state champion in the 200-yard individual medley and 500-yard freestyle. <laughs> Junior Ellie Caldo won the championship in the girls' 200-yard freestyle and is a repeat champion in 100-yard backstroke. Ta <laughs> She's not here, but let's give her a hand. She might be watching. <laughs> This is primetime TV, so I'm sure she's watching. 
Tatter and Juniors Kirsten Godfrey, Ellie Caldo, and Lilia McKendry won the girls' 200-yard freestyle relay and broke the state record while doing it. Caldo, Godfrey, Tatter, and senior Olivia Tillett won the 400-yard freestyle relay, a back-to-back -back state title for them, and they did it while breaking the event record. Congratulations to all these swim and divers. Virginia Purple Star Designation School. Our final recognition is for Newcastle Elementary School and Kentsville High School, which are awarded the Commonwealth first ever Purple Star Designation. Accepting the awards for their schools are Principal Heather Quinn and Melissa George and School Counselor Jennifer Carlson. This award recognized schools that are demonstrating a major commitment to students and families connected to our nation military. Something particularly meaningful since we live in the highest military impact state in the country. Furthermore, Hampton Roads and surrounding cities are the most impacted in all of the Commonwealth. These schools, along with six Virginia Beach schools, previously recognized are making an impactful difference for military children and their families. The Purple Star designation is presented by the Virginia Department of Education and the Virginia Council on the Interstate Compact on the Education Opportunity for Military Children. Congratulations. <laughs> Madam Chair, this concludes our recognition for the evening. It's going to be noisy, though. Dr. Spence, we look forward to hearing the superintendent's report. <clears throat> Thank you, and good evening, Madam Chairwoman and members of the board. It is a privilege to be here with you tonight and to share five things our community needs to know this month. First, it's hard to believe, but the last Beach Girls Rock Workshop of the Year will soon be here. This event will be held Saturday, March 30th at Salem High School from 8 a.m. to noon. The theme of this event is All the World's a Stage, Take the Lead. As a reminder, the event is open to female students in grades 5 through 8 and their parents. Interested students can register now in their school counseling offices. Second, there is still time to buy your tickets for the Pearls of Wisdom Oyster Roast and Barbecue. This year's Pearls of Wisdom will take place on Saturday, April the 6th at the 24th Street and Atlantic Avenue uh, Park from 1 through 5 p.m. Adult tickets are still available for $55. Tickets for children ages 6 to 12 are $15, and every ticket includes an all-you-can-eat buffet of oysters, pork barbecue, and much more. And, of course, all the proceeds from the event go to support the Virginia Beach Education Foundation and Teacher Grants. 
So we would love to see our community out there. And it did sell out last year, so get those tickets early. Number three, as you may know, March is celebrated as Music in Our Schools Month, and VBCPS is again proud to be hosting the Virginia Beach All-City Music Festival to showcase the talents of our elementary and middle school music students. On March 22nd through 23rd, more than 1,300 students will perform on stage at the Sandler Center for the Performing Arts in five separate concerts that are free to the public. For a complete listing of times, visit the Performing Arts calendar on vbschools.com. It's once again that time. It's once again that time at number four. It's time to look through your pantries and shelves and donate to the Beach Bags program. VBCPS and the Virginia Beach Education Foundation will host a Beach Bags food drive on Thursday, March 28th. Volunteers will collect donations for the Beach Bags program from 10 a.m. to 7 p.m. at Pembroke Mall, Southern Bank, and participating VBCPS schools. Of course, the Beach Bags program helps to provide shelf-stable meals and healthy snacks to VBCPS students who might otherwise go hungry during weekends and school vacations. And finally, at number five this evening, this is just a calendar reminder for families. Friday, March 29th will be a staff day. And in case you were wondering, this is not a virtual learning day, so students will not be reporting to school and will also not have virtual assignments to complete. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. That does complete my report. Thank you, Dr. Spence. Madam Clerk, do we have any speakers on agenda items this evening? Yes, ma'am, we do. I'll begin to start by calling three names at a time. I ask that each speaker come forward, be prepared to take the podium when the other speaker has concluded. If you have written remarks, if you'd like to provide them to me, I, I'll be happy to add those to the record for you. I also ask that you please hold your applause so that everyone's name can be heard. We'll begin with Dawn Newman, then Elizabeth Wright, then Elaine Fakiti. Can you hear me now? Okay. Yes. <laughs> I'm Elizabeth Wright. I'm going to be speaking about the All Day Kindergarten funding. The very areas that provide the highest amount of real estate tax revenue are the very schools that have been denied All Day Kindergarten to this point. These districts are subsidizing services that they are being denied. In my case, my particular school district produces the highest tax revenue from real estate taxes. I personally have been paying these taxes for upward of 13 years, and now that it is time for my child to benefit from these services, the city seems to not have any money available to fund a service that I'm entitled to. Real estate taxes are intended to fund education amongst other things. Your selection process for all day kindergarten is inherently discriminatory. As of today, if I want my child to, to have the benefit of all day kindergarten, I have no choice but to send her to a private kindergarten at a cost of upward of $10,000. Since I'm already carrying a higher tax burden by nature of where I live, I don't feel that I should have to carry this additional expense so that my child can have the same benefit of all day learning. You simply cannot accomplish what needs to be taught in a three-hour kindergarten day. Educators agree that EDK often outperform their half-day peers. The time for social and emotional development is critical. I urge you to either find it in your budget or ask City Council for the additional funding and or tax increase that is needed to implement kindergarten for the remaining schools by the fall of 2019. You have already come to the citizens of Virginia Beach and asked for a tax increase to fund all day kindergarten. It was my understanding that two thirds of the money that was supposed to be spent specifically on the implementation was spent on other items. I consider myself to be a fiscal conservative. And while I am not even remotely pleased that I may be expected to assume another tax increase, I am willing to accept it with the understanding that all remaining schools, with the exception of the three that are undergoing construction, 
will have all day kindergarten this fall. This issue should be of paramount importance for the board and for city council. For a school system that prides itself on being number one in the state, we sure are behind the curve on kindergarten. City Council spends a lot of money on development projects to benefit tourists. And I implore you to remind Council that it is the residents of the city that are paying the taxes and that $5 million that is needed to implement this plan can either be found somewhere in their budget or needs to be raised some other way. I personally think that if they can find money for pet projects, they can find the necessary $5 million, which is a pittance and a bargain compared to what Virginia Beach is used to giving out. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Don Newman, Elaine Fakiti, Michelle Riley. Good evening, Chairwoman Anderson, Vice Chair Melnick, Dr. Spence, and members of the board. My name is Dawn Newman. I'm a high school math teacher and secretary of the Virginia Beach Education Association. Once again, it is budget season, and I stand here tonight to advocate for employee raises and full day kindergarten. Through the Education Association, I have been following the budget conversation. I do not envy the tasks that you as a board have to tackle. I understand that once again, the funding of full day kindergarten is an issue that the board must address. Full day kindergarten is vital, and it is imperative that it be fully funded so that all of our elementary schools can offer this important class. I urge you to ask City Council for all of the funds you need to implement full day kindergarten. Quite honestly, this initiative should have been fully funded two years ago from the very beginning. Initially, the school board asked for $14 million and received roughly $6 million. This board should not have to go back to City Council and beg for more money to finish a job. I wonder if the developer of the very expensive Way Park will have to keep begging City Council for money. This full day kindergarten initiative must be completed. It is an equity issue if full day kindergarten, excuse me, if full day kindergarten is not offered to all of our elementary schools. Do what you must to get the money from city council to finish the job. Tax increases are not popular. However, the residents of Virginia Beach must remember that quality schools and vital programs cost money. I urge you to ask city council to do whatever they must to support the children of the beach. I know that everyone at the dais recognizes that in school, school employees are underpaid. I know that you are appreciative of employee contributions to the many accolades the division touts, but it is time to put your words of appreciation into action. You must ask city council for the funds to give employees a significant pay raise. Again, I remind everyone that quality schools require quality teachers and quality teachers require pay commensurate with their training and responsibilities. All school employees need and deserve a significant raise. As an employee of this school board, I am asking you to advocate for your employees and ask city council for the funds to give your employees more than the planned 3% raise. Words of appreciation only go so far. Actions speak louder. If you don't ask for a raise for the employees you say you value, who will? Tell city council that full day kindergarten needs full funding and tell city council that the employees who staff the amazing schools of Virginia Beach need a significant pay raise. It may be tough to ask for a tax increase, but everyone knows that the good things in life are not free. Virginia Beach schools are not good, they are great. Virginia Beach school employees are not good, they are great. It is time for the school board to ask city council to do the right thing for our children and fully fund kindergarten and properly compensate school employees. It is time for city council and the residents of Virginia Beach to do the right thing and fully fund kindergarten and pay the school employees the money they have long deserved. Sometimes doing what is right is not easy, but it must be done. Prove to your employees that their voices matter. Ask for the funding for full day kindergarten and a 5% raise for your hardworking and deserving school employees. Elaine Fakiti, Michelle Riley, Rona Marsh. Good evening, I'm Elaine Fekety, and I was here, I had the opportunity to speak to you two weeks ago. I have two children in the system, and I feel the need to come back. I believe Dr. Spence wasn't able to be here um, that evening, and it appears that the words fell on deaf ears to some of you. I would like to just put everything back into perspective and look at it like a household budget. I told you two weeks ago, um, the state of Virginia, the entire state of Virginia runs on a $50 billion budget and your estimation of needs at the beginning of this budget cycle was $1 billion. Now, I find it extremely hard to believe that you cannot find $4.7 or $4.9 million within that amount of money 
to fund the full day kindergarten if that is your priority. I was here two weeks ago to make sure the teachers were getting their raises and that you were finding the money and the budget for that. That is a priority. You are now saying full day kindergarten is a priority. That is what you put in your budget. That's not what you ask for above and beyond your budget. You need to realize if you do not already, as does everyone in this room, if you ask for a tax increase, that money comes out of the teacher's paychecks as well. You are negating the very raise you are giving them by asking for a tax increase to fund a full day kindergarten program, which if I understand correctly, will already be implemented over the next two years. You are simply asking to accelerate it this year rather than ask for a ta potential tax increase next year, which may be an issue for some of you running for office next year. Playing politics with the children, with our budgets, with our real estate taxes is not a pretty thing. It's not a good idea. It, the optics are bad. Please think carefully about this issue. Wants versus needs should not be a hard concept for the people that are in charge of educating our children. It's like taking a high school senior who you let in, in, I'm sorry, in the freshman and sophomore year take all electives and then all of a sudden when they apply to college their senior year they're asking for dispensation because they didn't take biology. That's what your budget looks like. How important is pre has full day kindergarten? How important are teacher raises? Put that in your budget and ask for something that you don't put your wants to the city council. It's really, it's, it's not a good look. I'm sorry, please reconsider asking city council for the money and find it in your own budget. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, again, <clears throat> again, I ask you to please hold your applause so everyone can hear their name. I have Michelle Riley next, Rona Marsh, and then Diana Howard. Good evening, everyone. Um, it's nice to see all of you. My name is Michelle Riley. I live in the Lynn Haven District. I have three daughters that attend Virginia Beach City Public Schools. Um, bless y'all's hearts. I'm super confused about this. In 2016, y'all already asked for a tax increase for all day kindergarten. And in the past two years, there's been a $44 million surplus that could have been used to pay for that. This could have already been it. I don't know why you're shaking your head because it's just true. These it's facts. Um, Virginia Beach spends about fourteen thousand nine hundred and twenty-five dollars per student. The state average is ten thousand nine hundred and eighty dollars per student. So we're already spending about four thousand dollars more per student than the state average. And we are not the first in line as far as school ratings. We're 29th. So we spend $4,000 more per student than the state average, and 29th is the best we can do. Please don't ask City Council for another tax increase for something that you guys should have already written into your budget and for something that there's 40, there was $44 million spent on other things. Put Chromebooks in every single kid's hands. We're giving uh, free lunch and breakfast to every kid in Title I schools, whether they um, meet the requirements for that or not. Um, we are spending seven hundred seven sorry seven million dollars on technology this year. Eighty thousand dollars in outside consulting fees. Three um, D printers, um, water bottle refilling stations. Taj Mahal schools that we can't afford that are lead standard buildings. Don't you think we could maybe cut the fat just a little bit somewhere and come up with the money instead of asking for another tax increase when the people in Virginia Beach just got one two years ago? Thanks. Next, I have Rona Marsh, Diana Howard, Kelly Walker. It's good to see you all here tonight. I'm glad that we have the members present. I am RM Marsh. I frequently post. You may have seen my posts. I may have reached out to you, uh, Ms. Anderson, as the chair. I speak frequently about the taxes to the city council. But I've come here tonight to speak to you because I think it's outrageous, outrageous that you're considering asking for another increase. 
And I don't know who's driving that. If it's you, Superintendent Spence, who makes more than the Secretary of Defense at nearly $240,000 a year, I don't know who is driving this. But the all-day or full-day kindergarten was fully funded two years ago. I sat in the council room where person after person, resident after resident, approached the microphone and asked the council not raise the taxes, which they did, $6.75 million. That was a huge amount of money, and you only used $2 million for full-day kindergarten, all-day kindergarten. $2 million. You asked for more. You over-budgeted. You have a habit of over-budgeting. You over-budgeted two years ago to the tune of $20 million. I've read the resolution. I got it from Farrell. Farrell is very helpful and cooperative. He gives me lots of information. I read the 2018 over-budget resolution. So if I add those two numbers together, 20 million and 24 million, you over-budgeted by $44 million. $44 million. I don't do that in my household. And you got $6.75 million. So Ms. Holtz, if you add those up, it's more than 50 and a half million. Ms. Felton, it's more than 50 and a half million. Ms. Melnick, it's more than 50 and a half million. And you've had that in 18 months. How can a school board go through 18 million, or in 18 months, go through 50 and a half million dollars? Yes, you bought school buses. Yes, you bought whiteboards. Yes, somebody bought $7 million worth of software, which I don't know that the teachers want or need, but I told Farrell I'm going to send him an email, and I want to know what that $7 million of software was. We need to pay the teachers fairly. Let me repeat that again. We need to pay the teachers fairly. We have too many people in top-heavy administration roles. We have over 40. What is it, 44 administrators? What are they getting? Why can't they take you know, a flat, no increase for a year. Get the teachers up to where they need to be so they don't leave. And yes, you got the money for the full-day kindergartens. You should have used it to implement the full-day kindergartens. But now you're coming back again and crying wolf to me as a taxpayer on a fixed income. And it really is pathetic. You're paid very well, Superintendent Spence. I would think you would have the wisdom to figure this out, to look at the money you're getting. What is it, $900 million you're asking for? You should be able to figure out how to fund full-day kindergarten out of $900 million. No one in this room should have to worry about it. And I will give this same presentation to the city council and probably call many of them personally and express my extreme dismay that you cannot run a school district with decreasing number of students. The thing that's so amazing is you are down 2,039 students in the last five years. Your numbers are dropping. Nobody is coming to these schools. You project in 10 years, you're going to be down 3,826 students. And in this, in a, a area of, that we have people on financial hardship, I'm going to send you all the Alice report, which is put out by United Way, and it talks about how much the families are struggling. And when families are struggling, you shouldn't go back to them and keep asking for tax increases. Thank you. I need to Diana Howard, then Kelly Walker, then Kathleen Brown. Good evening, everybody. I'm Diana Howard, and I'm the chair of the Virginia Beach Tea Party. And yes, we are taxed <laughs> enough already. As a lot of people have pointed out to you back in 2017, you asked for a tax increase for full day kindergarten. That was the same year you came up with that $20 million surplus, right? And now last year, you came up with the $24 million surplus. And in that uh, resolution, it was talking about $22.5 million that was left over from the operating budget, the school operating budget. And you called it a revision fund. I don't call that revision. I call that overtaxation. That's in your operating budget. Why didn't you incorporate that in there? When you did that first thing of asking for the, the school, you know, for the full day kindergarten, that was supposed to be over five years, okay? You have enough money for full day kidding, kindergarten for what you already budgeted for, for five years, right? So you don't have to ask for a town tax increase this year. And the other thing is I don't understand how everybody is so flippant 
about raising taxes as if it's nothing, right? It's just one cent, somebody said, right? Do you know that the city manager is also looking at a 1.5 cent increase in the real estate tax? And he's also looking at $2 a month for the trash fee. And on top of that, another one cent for the, the stormwater fee. Do you think this is nothing for people talking about the Alice Report when you have 40% of the you know, residents in Virginia Beach that are living from paycheck to paycheck or, and 7% that are actually in poverty? I mean, that's just ridiculous. I had some other figures here. Let's see if I can find them, right? Funding from uh, 2002 to 2017, state funding has increased by 34%. Local funding has increased by 54%. What the heck are you doing with all this money? And they already told you, you know, that enrollment has gone down. And it's even projected to go down another, you know, 4,000, minus 4%. So the cost of uh, per student, and this came from the superintendent's annual report. In 2002, was 7,372. In 2017, it was 11,507. Okay, this is ridiculous. So, I just don't understand how you can be so flippant. Here is another chart that got, this was from, um, I brought this up last year at city council, right? The, Local impact on a family household of four was $4,298.25. This year it's $4,356, right? And they have, you know, the little bit that it's added every year as if it's a little bit. The accumulative amount just since 2010 is an extra $1,000 plus to a family of four. That is not nothing to somebody living paycheck to paycheck. It's not nothing. Don't be so flippant about it, please. In a $900 million budget, you can't find $5 million to do full day kindergarten. I'm really shocked. Somebody needs to check your accounting. Kelly Walker, Kathleen Brown, and Green. I'm sorry, Reed Greenman. Good evening, School Board Chair Anderson, Vice Chair Melnick, members of the School Board, and Superintendent Spence. My name is Kelly Walker, and I serve as the President of the Virginia Beach Education Association. I am here this evening to request that the Virginia Beach City Public School Board ask City Council to not only fund full day kindergarten, but to also ask for additional funds for employee compensation. City Council will not act unless you, the school board, asks on our behalf. In October, we were encouraged to hear from the governor that he had amended the budget to include a 3% increase in pay for public school employees this upcoming school year. And many, including myself, thought, wow, now that the state has provided almost $10 million to Virginia Beach for raises this year, we should receive a significant increase in pay. But that did not happen. So where are we now? As professional educators, we understand the importance and the need for full-day kindergarten in our city. Full-day kindergarten allows all students the opportunity to achieve and excel. Full-day kindergarten is an essential need and must be fully implemented as soon as possible. School, school board employee compensation is also an essential need and must be a top priority. So the question is, why can't the school board also ask city council for the funding we need to implement full-day kindergarten and pay for, for VBCPS employee increases as well. It is time to correct the pay deficiencies that were caused by the lack of, lack of experience step increases for over 10 years. Since the Great Recession, educators in Virginia Beach have sacrificed through the elimination of true step increases. Healthcare costs have increased significantly and 5% of take home pay was diverted to VRS funding. As a result, the average teacher salary has only increased by 3% in 10 years. And if you include the VRS contributions, it essentially means no increases have occurred at all. If these trends continue and a major shift in how VBCPS compensates their employees does not occur, the results will negatively impact our community and our children. Virginia Beach classrooms will not attract nor retrain highly qualified and experienced educators. I urge the Virginia Beach City Public School Board to not only ask for funding to finish implementing full day kindergarten, 
but for funding to pay employees for their hard work and dedication to our city. The greatest casualties of the Great Recession were that we lost a true step scale for many employees and that class size was increased. Now is the time to address the compensation of the instructional step scale. It seems as there is always some other issues, such as whiteboard replacement, which are placed at a higher priority than employee compensation. Do not place employee compensation on the back burner. Make it a priority for our city, for our schools, for our children, for your employees. Therefore, we ask the school board to ask city council to fund the needs of the school division. Thank you. Next, I have Kathleen Brown, Reed Greenman, then Chris Brown. Hi, how are you? I'm Kathleen Brown. Um, I wouldn't be here today if this wasn't important. I have a six-month-old baby, two other kids in tow, so I'm hoping that you guys are going to listen. Although I'm a Virginia Beach citizen, I don't feel like you guys have been listening my whole entire time here. I currently have three children enrolled in Virginia Beach Public Schools, a 13, 11, and a 9-year-old. None of them have had all-day kindergarten and are still academically excelling. I do want to include that two of my children have been in half-day kindergarten while I was a single mother. And while this was a burden on me as the parent, I don't want to say that it is your responsibility to do my parenting so that I can have my life be easier. I just want to show that I'm looking at this from all of the angles. Truth be told, it is the job of the school board and the schools to ensure that my children are receiving a quality education while keeping them safe from emotional and physical harm, not to make my job convenient. I am not opposed to my children being in kindergarten all day, but I'm certainly not okay with the school board asking city council to increase funding again. Every time I turn around, you all are asking as your teachers for supplies, which I as a middle class parent am expected to provide. If you increase my taxes, how can I feed my children and continue to buy all these additional supplies that you all are asking for? Additionally, you guys are paying $14,700, and that is a conservative estimate, per student in Virginia Beach when I can send my kids to a top quality private school for just $12,700 in Virginia Beach here. Um, I feel fairly certain if my children were expected to complete a project, they would be held accountable with their grades. You all have increased taxes already. You guys need to find this money in your budget. You guys are accountable as elected officials. Thank you. Reed Greenman, then Chris Brown. <coughs> Good evening, school board. I'm not going to repeat a lot of the facts and numbers that were accurately just given to you. You're more than well aware of that. The fact that you don't budget very well is legendary. Once again, you're here just to demonstrate that inability to budget. A spending plan and a budget are two different things. Your budget is, this is the amount of money I have. What are my priorities and how do I spend it? Just like the rest of us in this room who have an income and take care of our homes. We don't spend the money we don't have. First of all, I'm encouraging you, stop soliciting tax increases. You've heard the reasons why. Clearly, you can find the money for this. I find it interesting when I prepared for this meeting tonight and I went through and I read your resolutions and I went through and read the packet. Hereby, be it resolved that $3.591,000 or $3.5 million will be taken from the Sandbridge TIF Fund to go into the school's PAYGO CIP with the remaining $409,000 earmarked for the operating budget for a total of $403 million and so forth. Wow, that's interesting. You went to the Sand Fund in Sandbridge to subsidize your operating budget and you took that money? Gee. Why didn't you go to the town center, TIF? They're rich with money. Why didn't you go to the ocean front and take money out of the TAP fund? Oh, politically not a viable, is it, Ms. Anderson? Don't want those people coming out at election time and turning out in droves to throw you off this board, right? You think you can come to us and keep taxing us? 
you got almost a billion dollars. You can't support all day kindergarten. I heard some comments tonight from the VBA about equity. Okay, you want some equity? Don't have any all day kindergarten until you can afford all of it. Just stop the program because there's no empirical data that it improves any education throughout the life of a student getting into high school. And as one woman just told you, her kids didn't have it. She paid for daycare. I get the politics of this. Why you're going to go off to city council and ask to put the burden on them for another tax increase when the city manager is already jacking up our taxes and fees? You guys don't get it. We cannot afford this. We cannot keep affording these tax and fee increases. You've got to stop. In your budget, you should be able to afford this if you want to do it. You had surpluses. You frittered the money away. Whatever it was. I remember when you took the money on the school buses, and I called up the guy in charge of the school buses, and I said, what buses do you need to buy? And he goes, oh, I don't know. I'll just figure it out once they give me the money. I don't have a list of buses I need to replace. I'll just look at ones that have the highest mileage. You raise the taxes for that. In your resolution, you talk about the fact that actually there's going to be a $600,000 slush fund in this tax hike for whatever. It's in your resolution. I I'm just stunned that you guys want a budget like this. It says this, estimated <clears throat> the school board unspent funds in the tax height, estimated at 600 k will be identified for capital improvement projects to replace school buses, um, replacement of furniture and equipment, technology-related items, field lighting, um, you know, and then be it finally resolved. You had a slush fund with all-day kindergarten last time and frittered the money away. You're not doing your job. Mr. Spence, I understand that you work for them. You guys need to tell him what to do, and you need to budget properly. Thank you. Next, I have Chris Brown. Uh, good day, everyone. My name is Chris Brown. This is actually the first time I've addressed the school board. Uh, and I am going to go over some of the numbers that people have said. Uh, in 2017, it was decided that all-day kindergarten would be introduced to the Virginia School Board, to a school system, and to achieve this, the city would need a real estate tax increase. Uh, that increase brought in $6.75 million in revenue. And of that $6.75 million, only $2.1 million was used for that stated purpose, and that was the reason that we had that increase. The rest was used for other items that were not disclosed to the public for the increase. And then that same year, the school board budget had a surplus of $20 million. And then the year after that, there was another surplus of $24 million. So in my reason, what this tells me is that the school board has a problem with setting priority and managing the resources entrusted to them. And as a realtor, I had the fiduciary obligation to my clients to look out for their best interests, to protect their money and their property. And as a elected officials, you have the same fiduciary obligation to the taxpayers of Virginia Beach. And by the numbers, it does not appear that you see us as your client, but as a tax livestock to harvest our money, our property, in order to fund your misallocation of our resources. So that said, and I, I'd really like to encourage the board to not request a tax increase but to examine your budget of $860 million and find the money from there to achieve all-day kindergarten. And, and I've been reading and seeing how there's less and less students in our school system. And the reason for that is a lot of my friends, a lot of peers, people my age, can't afford to live here. There's no opportunity for them to live here. So they're leaving. And that's why there's less and less students here. And I see it as a realtor, as I go in these people's homes, you know, they are living paycheck to paycheck. You know, they can't afford to live here with these increasing taxes and the assessments going up and all of this. So I'd really like to encourage you all to not ask for an increase and examine your budget to trim what is not necessary and use that to for this all day kindergarten. So thank you. Madam Chair, those are all the speakers that I have signed up for the hearing on citizens and delegations on agenda items. Thank you. <clears throat> the chair will entertain a motion to approve the minutes of our regular meeting on February 26th. 
The motion is made by Mrs. Riggs, seconded by Mrs. Felton. The voting board is open. The motion is Pat, Mrs. Rye. You are out of town. Okay, thank you. The chair will entertain a motion to approve the minutes of our special meeting on March 5th. The motion is made by Mrs. Riggs, seconded by Mrs. Hughes. The voting board is open. And Mrs. Melnick, did you vote on this one? Okay, thank you. This was the March 5th one. Okay. Miss Mrs. Alexander, um, how does she change her vote? Mrs. Rye. Mrs. Rye. Abstain change to yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. The motion has been approved. And the minutes of the March 5th meeting have been approved. The chair will entertain a motion to adopt the agenda for the meeting. This is the time if you want to change it. Okay. The motion is made by Mrs. Weems, seconded by Mrs. Holtz. The voting board is open. motion has passed for the consent agenda this evening on item 11a we have a course change request for the global studies and world language academy item b <clears throat> under the consent agenda is the new secondary course for peer tutoring item c is a marine biology course for the math and science academy item d is the recommendation of a general contractor for salem high school muau replacement and item e is the change in the bylaw 1-19 duties of the chairman and vice chairman. The chair will entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda. Motion is made by Mrs. Rye, seconded by Mr. Edwards. <coughs> the voting board is open. The consent agenda has been approved. Under action this evening, we have the personnel report and the administrative appointments. The chair will entertain a motion to, to approve. Mrs. Melnick has made the motion, seconded by Mrs. Felton. Is there discussion? Seeing none, voting board is open. The motion has passed. Plans for continuous improvement for select I schools. I do have a, an introduction for you. Okay, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. I would ask uh, Rachel White to please stand up. You all may recognize Mrs. White. Mrs. White has served as a teacher in Portsmouth Public Schools, teacher here in Virginia Beach at Princess Anne High School, most recently as a teacher at Kellum High School. And this evening, I am pleased that you have approved our recommendation for her to serve as the new coordinator of the Governor's STEM Academy and the Technology Academy at Lansdowne High School. Congratulations. <laughs> Sounds like you may have brought some guests. Yes. Would you like to introduce them? Uh, yes. Uh, this is my husband, John, and my son, Luke, and my other son, Chad. Thank you all for being here this evening. That's it, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Dr. Spence. Next on their action, we have plans for continuous improvement for select schools. The motion is, um, the chair will entertain a motion to approve. Mrs. Manning has made the motion, seconded by Mrs. Melnick. Is there discussion? Mrs. Manning. 
Yes, I would just like to thank Dr. Robertson for making those adjustments that I had requested regarding the referrals. I think it's extremely important that we do not indicate to our teachers that they can't refer students. And I felt that the language that was in those documents uh, needed to be changed. And I, I think we need to indicate to our teachers that if they do need to refer students for discipline problems, that um, they should have the ability to do that. So thank you for making those changes. Thank you. I think we all agreed with that. That's why we sent it back last week. But we, we do appreciate the, uh, the changes that were made. Is there any other discussion? Seeing none, the voting board is open. The motion is passed. Next, we have a resolution to request remaining funds needed to complete full day kindergarten implementation. Mrs. Melnick, would you please read the resolution? Resolution to request remaining funds needed to complete full day kindergarten implementation. Whereas the school board has submitted a budget resolution for the fiscal year 2019-2020 operating budget, which reflects a balanced budget based on the projected revenues from federal, state, and local funds, which includes revenue sharing formula funding, and whereas the total funds included in the balanced budget resolution total $905,946,317, and the school board desires to send to the city council a separate budget resolution that reflects the additional funding required to complete the last two years of the full day kindergarten program expansion. Now, therefore, be it resolved that pursuant to section four of the city school revenue sharing policy, the school board has determined that additional local funding is required beyond the bal balance budget and be it further resolved that the school board requests additional funding in the amount of $4,859,000 and be it further resolved that the purpose for the additional funding is to provide a continuing source of funds to complete a multi-year phased implementation of full day kindergarten for all eligible, eligible students. And be it further resolved that the school board supports an increase in the real estate tax or any other local tax from the revenue streams within the revenue sharing formula or any other revenue funds if and only if the city council determines that such a tax increase is necessary or an increase in the amount of dedicated funding from any of the revenue streams within the revenue sharing formula or from any other revenue funds. And be it further resolved that there are three elementary schools where full day kindergarten cannot be implemented next year due to ongoing construction projects affecting those schools. And consequently, the school board will use any unspent funds related to this additional funding estimated to be $600,000 solely for identified needs such as capital improvement projects, replacement school buses, replacement furniture equipment, and technology-related items, and be it finally resolved that a copy of this resolution be spread across the official minutes of the school board, and the clerk of the school board is directed to deliver a copy of this resolution to the mayor, each member of the city council, the city manager, and the city clerk, adopted by the school board of the city of Virginia Beach this 12th day of March, 2019. Thank you. Is there, a, is there a motion to adopt this resolution? Mrs. Holtz has made the motion, seconded by. I'll second it. Mrs. Riggs. <laughs> Sorry. Is there discussion? Mrs. Rye. Good evening again, everybody. Uh, I made a number of notes. Uh, from all the speakers who I thank for being here. So I, I think there's a few things that need to be addressed. I'm on the school board website right now. Virginia Beach City Public Schools average per pupil expenditure for operations, 12,100. I know a figure of 14,000 was floated out there and it didn't sound right to me so I looked that up. I want to talk about surplus. Uh, budgeting is not an exact science and no school system could function with the goal of budgeting with a zero surplus. We have in the past, I mean long before I came on board I've been assured that we have been within the two to three percent range 
And I want to talk a little about, a bit about what we did this year with what turned out to be the $18 million in changed revenue from last year. Uh, it was, that was the slightly reduced value after uh, factoring in the General Assembly, Senate, and uh, House of Delegate uh, bills. So of this $18 million, $16.1 million was allocated for the 3% teacher raise. $2.1 million was allocated for kindergarten expansion and a few other teacher uh, instructional positions. And, uh, and then there was a significant amount of money, almost $5 million, so I, well, I'll get to in a minute where that came from, for the very critical needs involving uh, for school, enhanced school safety and the ever critical and rising special ed costs. Now that money, when, we're, when I hear comments about um, not you know, trying to tighten our budget, our, our superintendent found he reduced the custodial staff to the tune of $5 million annually. And that $5 million was, was essentially allocated to special education and school security uh, costs. These were two of the, of the three primary needs that were expressed out in the community this budget season, the third one being employee compensation. So now to get to employee compensation, compensation I, I want to say this. Uh, for me, getting kindergarten funded at this point in time, and there is a strong will in this city in support of, of leveling, leveling the playing field sooner rather than later, will moving forward free up beginning next year more money in our operating budget for employee compensation. And I also want to mention, you know, it's, as, much, as many times as we have to address it, the original resolution for kindergarten could not have been more clear. It was over a three-year period, and there was a board member here with us at the time who is not, it was Mrs. McLeod, and out of deference to her, a number of us agreed to, with, it, there were a lot of reasons to implement it, not all at once. And over the three-year period, the first year of the $6.75 million, $2.1 million the first year, then about another $2 million this year, and now starting with this budget next year, the full $6.7 million, Will, will, will be applied to kindergarten. The, what, what the excess was applied to, and it was stated previously, was very explicitly laid out in the resolution, which was shared publicly, which was presented to city council, which was approved by city council. So to hear time and again these charges, you can agree or disagree with the original decision, but it was all above board, it was all transparent, it was all very public. And I also want to clarify that the $6.75 million never was, would have covered the full amount. The full amount is 14 whatever million, and Mr. and Farrell can clarify that. But 6.75 was to cover half the schools. We understand it's a little more than that now because there was some overestimate estimation that maybe the superintendent can discuss. Uh, and I think that's all I have to say right now. Thank you. What's the, what's the total dollar amount for unfunded mandates? I, I don't know. I don't know. Anybody you can ask. Um, Mrs. Linetti, on top of, uh, of everything that Mrs. Rye um, said, do you know the exact dollar figure um, annually for our unfunded mandates? I actually don't have that figure. We can get that. I, be, I believe you. it's around know forty-five we've had a million dollars. Yeah. right off the top. Mr. Hansiker, do you know that? Forty-three million dollars. So right <laughs> off the top, forty-three million dollars goes towards unfunded mandates. Okay, thank you. Right, and and what we mean by unfunded mandates? Let's be clear about that. Unfunded mandates are things that the the General Assembly dictates that we must do, <laughs> but they don't. yet they do not fund it. Or the federal government. Or the, or or the, the federal, federal government, government. correct. Right. So, so a, between a the two. A significant portion of that $43 million, for example, is in special education. Correct. So that, that comes off the top of our budget right off before we do anything else. They're called unfunded mandates. And, and then I believe, Mr. Hansiger, there was something else that you mentioned a couple weeks ago, and that had to do with um, 
CAPS. Could you elaborate on that just for a few minutes, what CAPS means? Yes. Um, prior to 2009, uh, all school divisions in Virginia uh, were get, even now, uh, funding formulas from the state for certain categories of expenditures. Prior to 2009, we had a funding formula uh, for support, instructional support positions. Those would be psychologists, social workers, guidance counselors, et cetera, a whole list of professional um, that support the instructional program, support teachers, uh, and work in many cases directly with students. The General Assembly, that was kind of in, in the middle of the recession uh, or right at the early points of the recession. And uh, the state was using some federal money um, to supplement the state basic aid. When that money ran out, the state changed the funding formula for support positions to school divisions and they put a cap on it. That cap for Virginia Beach in 2009-10 caused Virginia Beach to lose about $24 million. Every school division in the state lost those kind of, it was capped. Many of those school divisions had to go into a ripping situation and let employees go. We were fortunate here in Virginia Beach that we, were, we didn't have to do that. Uh, we looked at the figures for uh, 2020, projected for 2020, and we still, if, if that cap were removed, we would have an additional $24 million of state basic aid. So that was a tremendous loss to local school divisions across the state, and the state has never removed that cap or, or, or reallocated those funds. Thank you. I, I wanted to um, thank you, Mrs. Rye, for um, making it clear about some of the misconceptions that were stated this evening. Uh, I want to say a couple things myself. Um, the $600,000 that's mentioned in tonight's resolution that uh, w would be used for um, uh, one-time needs only would be only for next year alone. After that, after next year, the construction projects of the three elementary schools um, would be finished. And so all of our schools after that would be full day kindergarten. So that at the, at only next year would be the only year we would have the $600,000 surplus. And, and, and I believe I was told um, a few, maybe a couple years ago that we really need to be replacing school buses on the average of 50 school buses a year and we hadn't been able to do that for a very, very long time. City Council knew that. So two years ago, when we asked for $14 million to implement kindergarten, uh, full-day kindergarten, um, it, was, uh, it was understood <clears throat> that we had to do it on, on a gradual basis. First of all, we had to be able to hire the teachers. And we also needed to make sure we had the rooms and not have to put people in portables just to be able to implement full-day kindergarten. As it turns out, because of our, our gradual implementation, we have not had to put in portables just to be able to do full day kindergarten. We have the rooms. Um, we've been able to hire the teachers because we've done it on a gradual basis. But the first year, I believe we implemented um, 12 schools the first year. So we had a surplus of what the money was given from the, from the 6.7. And by the way, we asked for 14 million. City Council gave us 6.7. <clears throat> so, um, that first year, of course, we had a little bit more money left over, so we were able to buy some school buses that we hadn't been able to buy for many, many years. People uh, really were upset for many times. Many times we get phone calls from parents, you know, the buses broke down. Why are buses broke down? Well, buses break down because, you know, as they age, they don't work, work right. So if we're able to uh, replace about 50 buses a year, it keeps us on track. I believe we have over 700 buses, and isn't that correct? Between 650, and 700. Or between 650 and 700 buses. So if you don't replace at least 50 a year, you really fall behind. And so we had fallen so behind that we had buses that we were just we were piecing together. So that was part of the reason why we used some of the leftover money for the first year and the second year, which is which we're in now, 
uh, to replace some of those buses. We also bought some technology. Uh, we did some things that we had to do with one-time funding. And what we call one-time funding, those are things that, that you buy one time. Uh, we call them one-time funding because we know it's not repeated um, funding. We, we won't have anything left over if we do not have um, extra funding to implement full day kindergarten after next year. Next year will be our third year. Now, many of you have asked, why are we escalating the process? Why? Well, it was pointed out to you earlier this evening. It was stated earlier. It's an equity issue. And it's an equity issue that we've created. And I knew, I predicted it two years ago when we started this. I said, you know, once it gets started, we're going to have neighborhoods clamoring for full day kindergarten because they're going to be saying, hey, I pay my taxes. When is our school going to have a turn? We had somebody stand up here this evening and say, our neighborhood pays the highest taxes. And, and so what's happened is we have, it's an equity issue across our division now. We have about nine schools that are not on the list for next year. And they're not going to be on the list the following year if we don't get extra funding. Is that fair? It's not equitable. It's not fair. It's not fair to the schools. It's not fair to the communities. So yes, we created the situation by implementing kindergarten uh, partially a year after year. But now is the time to fix it. Now is the time to say we're going to we're going to fix this equity problem, and everybody, every school in our division after next year will have full day kindergarten. And that's only fair to do to all of our communities. So I, I don't mean to be lecturing everybody about this. I know it, I'm coming across as lecturing you and most of you out there who understand why we need full day kindergarten. I don't need to lecture you on it. But I just, I just want to say that there's, there have been many misconceptions stated here this evening. And <laughs> we need to make sure that, that you know, if you're going to come up here and speak, please be, you know, make sure that you're not being, giving us misconceptions about things that, that are just not true. So, um, by the way, um, so I, I, I'll, I'll stop right there because I need, I need to make sure that anybody else wants to speak has a chance. So, Mrs. Manning. So, I would like to thank all the speakers that came out to speak to us tonight. It's very important that we hear from our citizens uh, since this is going to impact you. So, thank you so much for, for coming to talk to us. Uh, two years ago, we agreed on a five-year plan. That's what we voted on. We agreed to a five-year plan to implement full-day kindergarten. And there were many reasons for that. It wasn't just financial. It was to be able to get the curriculum ready, transportation, hire teachers. And I still think that's an issue. Uh, during the entire two months of our budget discussions, uh, we did not talk about accelerating the full implementation of full-day kindergarten. That was not a part of our budget discussions. It wasn't until a councilwoman spoke to our school board chair about that the topic was recently introduced just a few days before we voted on our, on our budget last week. If accelerating full day kindergarten was a priority, then why was this not a part of our budget discussion so that we could put it within our current budget? Um, if this was a priority, funds could have been found in our nearly $1 billion budget. The, this budget is about priorities. We should, we, we've, heard, we've heard teachers come before us before us saying, put, put, to, put, your, put your priorities first. One of those priorities is making sure that our employees are properly compensated. And we've had teacher after teacher after teacher come and talk to us, and citizens as well, parents, not just teachers, that, that they don't want us to put any more programs ahead of teacher compensation. Well, this is an example of putting another item ahead of teacher compensation. The budget is about priorities, and because our citizens do not have unlimited funds for us to use, we need to prioritize our needs and our wants. Um, I, I heard it said, and I, I want to correct this, um, I, I think I heard it said that this was a request by the superintendent, and I've not heard the superintendent make this request to, to accelerate this program. Uh, I believe this did come from the board, so I don't want to put this on the back of the superintendent. Regarding the equity issue, yes, we do need to make this equitable. We need to make sure that all of our, our kids are receiving the same instruction. Um, but I don't think that delaying it a year um, is, is going gonna, is gonna to 
be inequitable. We've already delayed it a couple of years. And I think our citizens understand that, especially those citizens whose pockets are going to be affected by this tax increase. Um, I, I received uh, my assessment on, on my home, and it's gone up a lot. And I've heard a lot of other people say that their assessments have gone up a lot too. And so this isn't going to just be about a tax increase. This is going to be about assessments increasing as well. So, so we're going to be hit with that also. So I, I would just like to, to ask my colleagues on the board, and I would like to ask City Council that they strongly take a look at this because it's going to negatively impact our citizens. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Manning. Mrs. Weems. Yes, thank you. So much to say. Um, <laughs> We did have a resolution two years ago, and it was, it did specify that we were not going to use it all at once, and we were going to buy other things with that money. So it wasn't trying to be hidden anywhere. But the bottom line is the public, because of newspaper articles and talk, the tagline was, we're raising taxes for full day kindergarten. So that's, you know, and, th and that's really what the public thought. And that's what we were trying to do, but because of a, a myriad of reasons, we could not do it all at once. So I think that's where the confusion came, um, because folks thought it was disingenuous to say we're going to raise taxes and um, for full-day kindergarten, and then we spent so much of it elsewhere. Um, so we had a five-year plan, because we couldn't do it all at once. So like the chairwoman said, we created an equity Okay, so some people got it that first year. Some people are going to get it the fifth year, okay? And they understand that because of the reasons that we've said why we couldn't do it all at once. Okay, so this tax increase is really not to provide equity. It's not to make sure that we finish implementing it because we do have full-day kindergarten. We voted on it. We're going to implement it. Okay. So to ask for a tax increase just to speed it up a little, and we're still not going to be equitable because three of our schools cannot have it because they have buildings being built. So it's not going to solve the problem. Um, we have $907 million, almost a billion dollars. That's our budget. We need to prioritize. No, we don't have it. It's your budget. It's your money. It's not the school board's money. It's not city council's money. So when we go ask city council for money, we're not asking city council. We're asking you. We're asking our teachers. We're asking me. Okay? Um, and we chose to do other things. Like Ms. Manning said, this conversation did not come up for the three or four months we spent talking about our priorities and what we're going to do with our budgets. Okay? It didn't come up two years ago. No one said, let's speed it up a little bit. No, we decided to, uh, to do other things. We chose to do enhance our technology, and I'm not saying that's a bad thing. We chose to get a Chromebook in the hands of every first, second, and third grader. I didn't vote for it because I thought at that age they could share them, and that was expensive. We've chosen to buy software, which is very expensive. We ch we've chosen consultants, different positions, um, and the list goes on. So we chose to spend money in other ways because we already had this five-year plan. Nobody brought it up two years ago to speed it up. Nobody brought it up last year. Nobody brought it up this year until, what, a week ago? And, and we get a call of the chairman because city council, for some reason, and I still don't even understand how it came, decided that we, we needed to speed it up and, and ask for a tax increase. And so, again, you have a budget. You decide your priorities. And if you don't get everything that you want, you don't ask the citizens to foot, foot it, in my opinion. Um, the city has expenses. Last night I was at a Civic League and there was a um, police officer from, I think, Precinct 3, and they said they were 20% down from police officers. We've heard about the inability to buy police cars, you know, all sorts of things. So they have their priorities and they have to budget too. Um, and they have flooding issues. You know, so we could go on. Everybody has their needs, okay? So city council has their needs. Um, and I've heard from my colleagues, and, and we kind of talked about this last, last week, is, well, it's only one cent. City council is only going to do one, one and a half cents. That's only two and a half cents. On a $300,000 house, that, that might only be 50 or $60 or whatever. Well, I got from our CFO, and he got it from the city, all the taxes and fees 
in the last eight years that we have been paying, okay? Pages and pages, and it's line by line, okay? And some of them, and they've increased, and some of them have only increased a couple dollars. <laughs> One page, there were 47 that had, and 47 of them had increased, okay? We're talking about the trash fee, and that's a tax, stormwater, waste collection, water, real estate taxes, our increase in assessments, dog and cat licensing. We didn't see all these years and years ago. So all these are taxes. They're increasing fees. And what it does is it just keeps adding up and keeps adding up. So we're not just talking about a few dollars. We're talking about incrementally the, the, um, adding this year by year since 2008, since the recession, and taxpayers are paying a lot of money. I am paying a lot of money. Our assessments just came out last week. We will all be pay paying a lot of money, okay? And that's not right. We had a healthy budget, okay? We agreed on the, on the budget. We voted on it last week. We should not ask for an increase just to speed up a plan that we had already agree agreed on and voted on two years ago. <clears throat> if we do this, I mean, it's almost like I'm scared to think that what we're going to do next year when we decide for some reason that we don't have the money or don't have, you know, to, to do the last three schools. Um, and so I would encourage my colleagues and encourage city council to stay within your budget. We have to at home. You know, you have your budget at home, and if you don't put everything into it, you wait. You're patient. I'm sorry that every classroom cannot have full-day kindergarten, but it was this body chose to do other things first, okay? So we can wait another year, okay? I don't want to get in the habit, and this is, will be two times in three years that this body has said we cannot stay within our means, and we're going to let the taxpayers foot the bill Okay, and it's not right, and so I will not support any um, request to ask city council for a tax increase, and, um, and I think most people will understand that. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Weems. Mr. Edwards. Like Mrs. Rye, I too listen to the speakers, and uh, time and time again you told us we could find it within our, <clears throat> within our large budget. And you're absolutely right. We could find it in our budget. Our budget is big. It is 85% compensation. The way to find it would be very simple. We could not compensate our teachers as planned, as currently budgeted for next year, the budget we passed last week and sent to city council. We, uh, we could keep that compensation level for the employees that we had planned on and reduce the number of employees by increasing class sizes. We had to do that 10 years ago during the recession, and we've been scrambling to undo that error for the past decade. I don't find those find it options very palatable. If we don't ask for and receive the funding for completing the full day kindergarten this year, we'll be in the same position next year in terms of trying to fund it internally by finding it with those same two options. I don't find that very acceptable or meeting the standards that our community expects from its schools. Yes, this will put us in a position of having asked for more funds above the formula twice in three years. The only reason we're asking for a second time is because we were not granted the funds that we asked for two years ago. We asked for funding of the entire amount. This is the, if you consider that a single ask, and I think it's appropriate to consider it that way, this will be the second time 
in the past 21 years that I served that we've ever asked for funds above the formula. I don't take this, this action lightly at all. It is serious to ask for more. But there are rampant teacher shortages across the country. Educators are underfunded across the country. We have teacher shortages and compensation issues in the Commonwealth and, and right here in Virginia Beach. And if we think we can not compensate as needed now and in the future, then we're only we're, we're going to be exacerbating what is a bad problem across the country and a problem here in Virginia Beach as well. That's why I will very reluctantly um, vote in favor of this ask. Um, again, I don't want anybody to misread this like a, a cavalier flippant approach. It is not. It is very, very, very difficult um, decision by everybody up here. <laughs> Thank you. Mrs. Hughes. I cannot support asking for a tax raise. And it is true that only a third of what we got before was used for kindergarten. And while it was in the resolution, it's kind of like fine print. It was marketed as money for full day kindergarten. And, you know, again, this, this time asking for more tax money after the budget's been talked about and talked about and talked about. And of course, we know three schools are not going to be able to implement full day kindergarten. And I fear we'll be back here in a year or two asking again. We spend a lot of money. We have a nearly $1 billion budget. We spend too much on buildings. We have a huge central administration. I'm not sure if teacher raises are going up at, at the same rate as central administration. We spent money on the one-to-one -one technology. We have a lot of software programs that teachers say are not worth the money we're spending. We have a lot of bloat in this budget that we could get rid of. We need to fund our needs instead of our wants. We should have found the money for teacher raises and we should be able to find the money for full day kindergarten if we want to speed it up and implement it. And I want to say that people on the dais and people that have come up and spoken talk a great game about equity, but all of these fees disproportionately affect lower income people. And some of those people are your teachers that did not get the raises that they expected to get. And I, I fail to see how you can talk about equity when you're going to raise fees where you want to raise them for the school, they'll get fees through the city that lowers their income. We need to stop treating the taxpayers like an endless ATM machine. Thank you, Ms. Hughes. Ms. Melnick. Um, Mr. Hansiger, um, just for clarification, um, we are not specifically asking for a tax increase, correct? No, we're not. Okay. This formula is basically telling city council if and only if we are asking them to find the money themselves and That's we are not specifically asking for a tax increase. That's correct. Thank you. Mrs. Rye and then Mrs. Manning. So Mr. Hunziker, could you share with everybody here tonight the response you emailed to us about the uh, just to put it in context, our ask, what the average cost per $300,000 household? Um, a $300,000 home assessed at $300,000, um, the amount of money that uh, we're asking for for full day kindergarten for next year uh, would equate to a $25.50 annual increase in the property tax. If Thank if it was funded with real estate tax. Right. Thank you. Right, and that's a big if. <laughs> oh, right. Um, Mrs. Manning. Okay, and that's on top of all the assessments that have gone up as well, I'd like to point out. And uh, our revenue sharing formula that we have with the city, the agreement that we have with the city to fund us, specifically states, and correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Hansiker, it specifically states if we ask for funds over and above our budget, we are doing so in support of a tax increase, correct? That is technically correct. Yes. Thank you. 
Um, and I would like to address Mr. Edwards' comments about not being able to find the money in the budget. I, I asked a lot of questions about the budget this year, as I always do. And um, one of the questions that I asked was about software and software in the classrooms. And I'm not, I'm not saying that software is not useful. It is. I, I've, I've talked to a lot of the teachers about the software that we're using in the classroom. And, you know, pros and cons. I, I've heard both negative and positive on it. Um, we're spending $2.3 million this year on one software program in our classrooms. I've heard some pretty positive things about that software. Um, so I'm not saying it's bad. However, I don't think it's a necessity. Um, and so when you talk about not being able to find funds, there are funds. Again, it's about priorities. It's not that we can't find funds. It's about priorities. Thank you. Are there any other comments? Ms. Williams. Yes, I, I like the comment of, of funding internally. I think we should be funding internally. That's called balancing the budget and not overspending. So I completely support that. And, um, and again, when we ask for th this, we are asking for a tax increase because we know our city, again, has a lot of um, issues and a lot of priorities. And if they are going to ask for a tax increase, that means that they perhaps don't have, haven't met their wants and needs. And, um, and so I think that that's just a, a different use of words. I, th I think we all know that by doing this, according to what Ms. Manning read and according to the own our own resolution that we're going to send over there is that we are asking for our taxpayers to um, to foot the bill for again not providing equity and not voting to do kindergarten because we've already done that it's just to speed it up just a year and I just I, I can't get my mind around raising taxes for that thank you I just want to reiterate that if we were given the, the amount that we asked for two years ago we would be here now uh, we, we knew two years ago that it wasn't enough money to fully fund all of our 54 elementary schools. Is it 56? 54, <laughs> I thought. Um, so we knew two years ago that, that the money that we received, 6.7, would not fund all of our schools. Um, so we expected to come back and ask for more. And uh, as far as the five-year plan, it was something that we discussed um, but I, I don't I don't recall that we actually voted to do it in five years. We we said that we we would try to implement it in five years, but we knew that in three years we would have to come back and ask for more money because they didn't fully fund what we asked for to begin with. Seeing no other comments, uh, I'm going to say that the voting board is open. So the resolution has passed, seven to three. <clears throat> Next, we move on to information for this evening. First, the first um, information item we have has to do with building utilization committee report. Don't take it personally that everybody's leaving. That's no, perfectly fine. I just wanted to give it time to let a little bit of the noise uh, come down. Madam Chairwoman, Dr. Spence, members of the board, uh, we are here to update you on this year's Building Util Utilization Committee. I am going to keep the introduction brief for tonight, uh, and I'm going to bring up Melissa Ingram, who is our uh, demographer who does the detail of the number crunching, and she's going to present you the brief. And then Ms. Rye, our duly elected chairwoman, chairwoman will... Uh, uh, conclude it with some remarks. So, uh, Melissa, I will turn it over to you. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Welcome. Uh, my name is Melissa Ingram, and as a school division demographer, I'm happy to be here tonight to um, share our, the Building Utilizations Committee 2018-19 annual review. Uh, the B... Ooh, I'm so sorry. Sorry. Uh, the BUC is governed by policy 5-14, 
This policy establishes procedures for the committee's annual review of enrollment trends and their impact on the school division's facilities and related attendance zones. Through this policy, the BUC is also tasked with formulating redistricting rec recommendations, if any are deemed necessary, with the intended goals of achieving optimal utilization of space in our school facilities and limiting any adverse impacts to the community by redistricting as few schools and students as possible. With division-wide building utilization standing at 10.6% under capacity this year, the BUC has reached consensus to make no recommendations for changes to the school attendance zones for the upcoming 2019-20 school year. Many on our school board are familiar with this policy and the relevance of the committee's work on effective long-range planning. The 2018-19 BUC is comprised of seven members, with three school board members from which Ms. Carolyn Rise serves as the committee chair, two members of staff appointed by the superintendent, and two members of the community representing the Council of PTAs and the Council of Civic Organizations. The BUC reviewed September 30, 2018 K-12 membership data from various perspectives, including the school level, grade level, and division level perspectives. 66,820 students are served throughout the division in over 86 facilities. The impact of student membership on these facilities, which is measured through building utilization, is dictated not only by the number of students, but also by students' programmatic needs, ranging from special education resource needs to specialty academic programs, all of which are aimed at supporting students' academic achievement, growth, and development. Division-wide student membership has declined by 334 students, or half a percent, from the previous 17-18 school year. This slight decline in enrollment is in line with the parameters we have been using for enrollment projections, with last year's projection for the current 18-19 school year being off by only 68 students, or a tenth of a percent. Looking at historical student membership, this graph illustrates the slight decline we experienced last year as compared to the more drastic decline we were experiencing roughly a decade ago, which can be partly attributed to the economic recession experienced at the local and national levels. Student membership peaked in 97-98, which is where this graph starts, at 77,500 students, following that growth that happened in Virginia Beach in the 70s and 80s. Over the following decade, student membership declined 9% by 0809, roughly midway through this graph. In comparison, from 0809 to where we are today in 1819, the decline continued at a less drastic rate of 4% of over 10 years in comparison to the 9% of the 10 years before that. Adding the projected student enrollment, this trend, this trend of slight decline is projected to continue over the next five years, allowing for a fairly stable student population. The committee reviewed and discussed related factors attributing to these trends. Births, which had declined slowly from roughly 7,700 births per year in 1992 to current trends of the last four years with births between 6,000 and 6,100 per year. Housing trends and community impacts on student generation vary among attendance zones, but have been fairly stable citywide. Staff continues to monitor these trends throughout the year as the millennial population are entering their 30s and younger age range population estimates increase in some areas. Student distribution across a division varies by area with the highest density shown in dark blue and lower density shown in yellow. These densities align with school attendance zones organizing students throughout the city into home school buildings. Optimum capacity of a school building is derived from an annual review by principals and administrative staff at the start of the school year which determines the number of seats that can be accommodated in a school building, considering both student population needs and program requirements. Optimum capacity fluctuates annually due to student numbers and needs per grade level. Teacher-student ratios also have a significant impact on capacity. The current school year, all schools are either within an acceptable utilization rate of plus or minus 10% or under capacity. Division-wide schools are 10.6% under capacity, with elementary schools as a whole 8.6% under capacity, middle schools 10.7% under capacity, and high schools 11.1% under capacity. 
Looking at the elementary school level, we have roughly 30,000 students spread out over 56 school facilities. All schools are either within an acceptable utilization range within plus or minus 10% of their current school year's capacity. These attendance zones are shown in white on the map. Or schools are under capacity, less than 10% of the current school year's capacity, with these attendance zones, attendance zones being shown in yellow on the map. No schools are over capacity, greater than 10% of the capacity. If schools were determined to be so, they would be shown in red. Looking at the middle school population, we have roughly 16,000 students spread out over 16 school facilities. All schools are either within an acceptable utilization range, shown in white, or under capacity, shown in yellow. No schools are over capacity at the middle school level either. And at the high school level, we have roughly 21,000 students spread out over 12 school facilities. As with the elementary and middle schools, we are doing well, as all high schools are either under capacity, shown in yellow, or within an acceptable utilization range. There are currently no schools under capacity. The monitoring and work that the BUC has done throughout the years shows at all three school levels we just reviewed. With no schools currently over capacity, schools have the flexibility to offer needed resources and programs that strengthen 21st century learning for VBCPS students. Thank you for your time and the opportunity to speak to you about this important work today, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Do we have any questions, comments? Mrs. Rye? Just waiting on questions first. Anybody? Well, I'll go ahead and just thank the staff, the committee. Uh, we had our meeting in November, and uh, it just turns out kind of coincidental timing that coming up next on the agenda policy, the attendance zone policy, uh, does include some, I, I think, very enhanced wording for the, the BUC portion of the policy. And one of the things it does is, is recognize and, and assure moving forward that we will have presentations each year whether or not there is a redistricting recommendation. We, we agreed this is important enough information. I know it's a, it's a, uh, a lot to absorb. There's more to absorb, so if any of you have the, the, uh, the urge to, uh, to get more information, uh, my committee, Laura Hughes is another committee member seated here. I also want to acknowledge two members from the community who could not make it here tonight, but Alice Catherman, our Council of PTAs president, and Mary McFadden, the Civic Association Council president. Uh, who also serve on the committee. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have policy review committee recommendations. Mrs. Lonetti. Good evening. Our first policy up tonight is policy 4.2. We've looked at this before. This is a general employee conduct policy. In particular, some of the questions, and I believe it was Mrs. Manning had presented to us, had involved the wording in subsection A1. We had a lot of words having to do with more moral responsibility, things like that. We went back and checked against the code section, and we've made some revisions to that. And it currently reads, that um, one, as serve as role models for students in the school division, all employees must recognize that a, as a condition of their employment, they must model legal, moral, and professional behaviors both inside and outside the school, to, outside of the workplace. Those words model what we see in the state code having to do with teacher relevance and discipline issues on there. We felt that that was an appropriate modification of the terms. The rest of the terms we've reviewed before the just general explanation of conduct, section B talks about employee student relations. This is a significant increase that we felt was necessary. It also been suggested by the Virginia Department of Education to make these changes. C talks about disciplinary actions and how and when we will discipline, and most of the rest of the policy does not change at that point. Are there any questions on policy 4-2? Moving on, we're going to look at policy 514. This has to do with school attendance zones. We worked quite a lot on this particular policy on there. In particular, and I think we brought this back once before to you, we have moved a lot of the information that was in policy into the regulation 514-1 because thought we thought it was more appropriate in regulation. So some of the terms that you may have seen before did not disappear. They simply fell back to the regulation. 
One of the changes I do have to mention, this is pointed out to me by Mrs. Weems, on page 2 under section C, subsection 3, formulation of redistricting recommendations. We do need to cross out certain words that the PRC had recommended this. And the first sentence it reads, the BUC may receive at the onset of its discussions a proposed redistricting plan developed by the superintendent or designee. We would then be crossing out the words which may be which may include a recommendation for no action. So it simply will be developed by the superintendent designee to provide a basis for which to move forward in making recommendations. And then the next sentence, any such plan that involves redrawing boundaries may be considered by the BUC. Further down, we talk about in subsection A, redistricting recommendations and how they'll be presented. In particular, the BUC will prepare a final report no later than March 15th of each year, and the report will be presented by the BUC chair or designee to the school board for information at the meeting no later than the school board, second school board meeting in March. So we just complied with that. And subsection B, Redistricting recommendation. If the BUC recommends redistricting, the preliminary presentation to the school board will take no take place no later than the first meeting in January. The, the policy review committee felt it was important to move that date up to give you time to consider for both budgeting and making plans for the next school year. Other changes in this are not significant changes. They simply moved around wording that we'd had in there before or moved wording over to the regulation. This is a, uh, an important policy. You see a lot of our decisions made. This questions come up with the public, but we don't believe that this is a significant change to this policy as written before, and we think it uh, just cleans up language. Are there any questions on 514? There are no questions. We will move on to... Oh, 548, student social activities sponsored by the school division. We made somewhat significant changes under subsection B. Subsection B deals with off-campus school-sponsored student social activities. In particular, the wording will now read, school-sponsored student social activities to be held off of school property must, be, must have the prior approval of the school principal and the Department of School Leadership. The activities... Or such activities shall not be permitted in areas where supervision of students is impractical or impaired, where reasonable safety precautions can be cannot, I mean, where reasonable safety precautions, I think this should be, cannot be implemented, or students and staff will have access to tobacco, tobacco products, drugs, vaping products, electronic cigarettes, or other products, weapons, unauthorized materials, the code of student conduct, and all applicable policies and regulations and laws will be enforced during such activities. We felt necessary to clarify what the conditions were going on in those um, types of social events. We also were trying to segregate out teacher employee events versus just straight student social events. Are there any questions on this policy? The no questions, moving on to policy 550. There were not any significant changes on, on this, except for on subsection B, which has funds for gifts. We added a section in the last sentence that reads, no student funds shall be used to purchase gifts for an individual other than nominal gifts, parentheses under $30, in parentheses of, rec of recognition or sympathy. We felt that there would be times when a student fund might want to send flowers to somebody if they had uh, they've been in death in the family, and we thought that was appropriate amount, so we limited the amount to $30. We also put under subsection C, the exchanging of gifts. School personnel would be responsible for complying with applicable law, policy, regulations concerning accepting gifts, as mentioned. Um, and, and other times look at policies, a conflict of interest at all, it defines when you can and can't accept gifts and how you have to report them. We are going to leave responsibility up to staff members who receive any gifts to make sure they're in compliance. Are there any policy, questions on that policy? Moving on to policy 551, student vehicles. We made some um, significant changes. We decided that most of the information here was more appropriate in a regulation, so we simply rewrote it out. It does state that students with valid driver's license may drive to and park at their assigned schools in accordance with applicable regulation. Then we've designated to the superintendent designate the authority to develop regulations, and we've set forth different things that we thought were necessary to be involved in uh, anything involving bringing vehicles to school. I'm not going to read all of them to you. They're explained there. At the end of that paragraph, it reads, parking fees will be annually approved by the school board. This does look significantly different than before. We felt it more appropriate that most of this information then appear in a regulation that the superintendent staff can deal with. 
Are there any questions on policy 551? Moving on to policy 553, this has to do activities and access to school facilities. There are only minor changes made in this. We just made some corrections in the final subsection C involving designating the superintendent's um, designee or procedures. Nothing else has changed in that. We corrected some editor's notes and updated some of the legal references. Other than that, there would be no changes. Are there any recommendations to file uh, questions regarding policy 553? Madam Chair, if there are no further questions, that would end the presentation of the PRC. Thank you. Do we have any standing committee reports at this time? Mrs. Rye? Okay. Our gifted advisory committee meeting was last night. I attended as the alternate. Uh, and I they focused on uh, their site visit reports, and I, comp I, I actually took the time to compliment them. I told them, you know, we visiting schools is part of our job as well, but very impressed with how seriously they take this role. They, they go for two-hour visits, and I think I pointed out last time they have a template now for how, uh, how they prepare their report. And it, they were, the reports were just so thorough, and even the... You know, and part of their job is to find out what more they or we can do to help these G GRT teachers, gifted resource teachers, and that they make the teachers comfortable enough that the teachers can be very frank in, in their discussions with, with, the, uh, with the members. Um, and, uh, you know, different things come up, whether it's scheduling and the GRT role in that with school scheduling, clustering particularly in the at the secondary level and trying to get tight you know i just learned a lot about tighter clustering is the goal uh but it, it is a secondary challenge uh spanish immersion even came up uh, about the added challenge of of where the gifted services fit in in, in that context so that that was a very interesting discussion uh, and emerging scholars was something else that was mentioned frequently uh, and i think we're all familiar with that here up on the dais um, and then they just you know they, they do have a number of vacancies coming up um, and the the chair herself who's who's done a stellar job is, will be stepping down so that will be one of the positions to be filled and um, they're looking forward to their upcoming school board report later this spring thank you thank you mrs rye any other standing committee? Mrs. Riggs? I just wanted to um, give a report on Sister Cities. We did have our Youth Ambassador Gala uh, on the 1st, which was, um, it'll be two weeks this coming Friday. And um, some stellar performances by our students. The student that was chosen um, that won the competition was Suma Kuba. She is a uh, international baccalaureate student at Princess Anne High School, and um, very impressive. She's been in this country as an Iraqi um, citizen, or a citizen of the United States now, for the last 10 years. She came 10 years ago not speaking a bit of English, and the command she has on the English language would put me to shame, and many of us, because she speaks so eloquently, and she um, shared her her um, journey and her family's journey from Iraq to um, the United States uh, and why. And so it was very impressive, including in the other students, the second and third place, um, there was an Irish um, a, a girl that represented the Irish river dancing, and she did a super job. And then another, and she was the junior as well, just like Suma was. And then a ninth grader that writes her own compositions, and she won the third place, which were all um, scholarships towards their colleges. So uh, very impressive. I would love for us to be able to meet um, our first place winner, and so I will be talking to you about that in our coming uh, events. Possibly. Thank um, so thank you, everyone, that um, were able to come and enjoy our, um, our students and what they've 
what they've learned and what um, they had to share. We also had Kurt Williams from Channel 3 be in our MC. He did a great job. We have our uh, annual Sister City uh, Breakfast Leadership um, Breakfast on the 4th of April, which um, I handed out invitations today. So hope you guys can come. Thank you. Thank you. Any other standing committee reports? Mrs. Felton. Madam Chair, we didn't do administration, but I just would like to mention and send a shout out to GRC, Green Run Collegiate. I had the opportunity to be at their first meet and greet internship program, and it was really wonderful. Uh, I enjoyed it. Uh, we had uh, constituents who come out, and this is where the students would do their first time internships with law offices and uh, loan companies and veterinarians department as well. I don't know if I can name any of those out as we speak, but um, it was a real great turnout. And I just like to say that the GRC students are moving on out and they're doing really great with this new internship program. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. That concludes our meeting.